Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Psalm 60 as we continue to work through the Psalms. This will be the last Psalm of the summer. We're going to take a mild detour next week and then get back into Matthew in the fall. If you're using one of the Blue Chair Bibles, it's on page 478. And as you turn there, I want to start with this idea to help us understand the text. And that is stealing from the uh, addiction recovery world. The first step is admitting you have a problem. Again, for many of us, we're used to hearing that in the context of the world of addiction and rehabilitation. That you can't really begin the road to recovery without admitting the problem. But I have found in my experiences that that is not just true for that world. That so many things can only bring about healing when we first admit and acknowledge the problem. Even in the normal parts of life, having a conflict or a fight with someone, maybe your spouse Maybe a sibling. Healing can only really begin when the problem that caused the fight is named and acknowledged. And again, generally speaking, before you can find a solution, you have to know the problem. And it's that idea that I want to use as a lens to view and understand Psalm 60. For us to have a healthy relationship with God, oftentimes that starts with admitting we have a problem. At the center of this psalm in particular is the idea of God's discipline and our need to be restored to God. And I'm going to be relying on that idea of restoration to be at the center of our understanding of this psalm for our lives today. And in one sense, this gives us another category, another flavor of lament. Exactly different from what we saw last week. Let me, let me read you from Psalm 59, just to remind you of one aspect of Psalm 59. David says in verses 3 and 4, For no transgression of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. So in last week's psalm, David is suffering even though he's innocent. But here, the adversity that David and God's people are experiencing is directly related to God's discipline of their sin. In this psalm, they are not innocent. And again, these are different categories. And... and, Not to go off on too much of a tangent, but one of the ways we get into problems is where we don't understand that both these categories exist. Sometimes you experience problems through no fault of your own, and you are an innocent sufferer. But other times, it is God's discipline on your life, and wisdom helps you to know the difference. But you need to know that both categories exist. And we're going to deal with that second category today. How do you deal with the hardship you are experiencing when it is God's discipline on your life? And where he is using that adversity to bring you to repentance and faith. So today we're going to see both God's rejection of his people and his discipline but also the path to restoration. So let's look. Psalm 60, beginning in verse 1, we're going to see God disciplining his people. Follow along as I read verses 1 to 3. O God, you have rejected us, broken our defensive. You have been angry. O restore us. 
You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. So this psalm begins with David declaring that God has rejected us. That God is angry with David and Israel. And because of that, God has broken our defenses. One of the things about this psalm that's represented there in that idea of broken our defenses is that one of the repeated themes in the history of Israel found in the Old Testament is that when they are experiencing God's favor, they win their battles. But when they are being disciplined by God because of their sin, they lose their battles. And this is a very helpful, vivid, concrete picture for us. You can read of this in in places like Judges chapter 1 and 2 and Numbers chapter 13 and 14, which is the first time they try to enter the promised land. Let me read an excerpt from Numbers chapter 14. Again, this is where they're supposed to enter the promised land, but but they are not because they do not trust the Lord. They sin against the Lord and therefore he thwarts their ability to enter the promised land. Listen to Numbers 14. Do not go up, for the Lord is not among you, lest you be struck down by, before your enemies. For there the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned back from following the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. So one of the broad truths that the Old Testament tells us is that God is sovereign both over Israel's victories and their defeats. And as we'll see a little bit in the next couple verses, David tells us that he views what he's experiencing as the direct action of God. But before we get there, I want us to see what David wants from the Lord. So he says in that opening verse that he is experiencing the rejection, anger, and discipline of God. And what does he want from the Lord? He wants restoration. David looks at the defeat of Israel, the breaking of their defenses, and he cries out to the Lord to be restored. And using the language of Numbers 14 that I just read, David understands that God has rejected them because they have turned back from following the Lord. See, one of the big ideas I want you to take away from this psalm is the humble and repentant nature of this psalm. God is disciplining his people because of their sin And therefore, they must repent so that they might be restored in their relationship with God. And we need this category in our own lives. Sometimes we experience hardship because God is trying to get our attention to lead us to repentance. And that we experience God's rejection and his discipline to show us our need for restoration. And after that opening verse, the next two verses speak more to the discipline of God against David and against the people of Israel. And as I read this, I want you to notice that David presents God as the clear actor in this situation. David is not a victim of his circumstances here. He's not a victim of the randomness of this world. He is experiencing God's discipline, and he presents it clearly. Look at verses 2 and 3. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. David 
compares God's discipline of his people, right? Because all these, you have made us see, you've done this to your people. This is not talking about the nations. This is talking about Israel. Look at that first one in verse 2. You've made the land to quake. You've torn it open. Repair its breaches for it totters. God's discipline of his people is like an earthquake that God has caused. David knows that while God is the one sending the earthquake, he is also the only one who can stop it and restore his people. So at the same time he acknowledges that God has made the land to quake, he also calls on God to repair its breaches. David continues with another metaphor of God's discipline in verse 3. Here David begins with the truth that God has made his people see hard things. The NIV is helpful to us here in their translation as they translate the idea of saying, you have shown your people desperate times. Again, it's very clear that David is saying to us that God has caused the people to experience hardship. And then David gives us this poetic picture at the end of verse 3. You have given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. When you are intoxicated, you are out of balance, you stagger, you are not stable, you cannot regain your solid footing. Just as an earthquake makes the ground unstable, here the wine makes the person unstable. Not to get too far ahead of myself, but we need to have a category that sometimes God uses hardship and his discipline to get our attention. An earthquake gets your attention. When the ground beneath you is not stable, you pay attention. When you are stumbling like a drunk, sometimes that's when God is able to get your attention. Can we be honest with ourselves that sometimes we need an earthquake to wake us up. One of the things that has become clear to me as I interact with people is most of the time we need a crisis. We need a hardship to get our attention. And that's what this psalm is speaking to. That sometimes when something is difficult or painful, that's when we wake up and we see our need for Jesus. But praise the Lord that at those times, God is there and he will restore us. Let's see this in verses 4 and 5. So after talking about God sending an earthquake and causing his people to stagger like a drunk, we have verses 4 and 5. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. Even in his anger, even in his discipline, God has not abandoned his people. He has set up a banner. This this is referring to setting up a signal or a sign as here's the place to come to for safety. And he offers refuge and safety for his people. It is a place that his people may flee from the bow. And this safe place is for those who fear you. Fear is one of the ways that the Bible describes our relationship to God or what our relationship to God should be. We should fear the Lord. It's a great word because it encompasses many complementary truths. It encompasses our submission to God, our respect of God, our worship of God, our recognizing that He is God and we are not. And those are the ones 
who can come to the banner and find peace and rest and safety. I think it's fitting that David uses this word to describe us or what we should be in the larger context of this psalm. It's only when we humble ourselves before the Lord in faith and repentance that we can find our refuge in Him. Again, this runs throughout this psalm to humble ourselves before the Lord. And we see this in this idea of those who fear Him. Now, the second part of this section in verse 5 shows us that those who come with to God with humility and fear are loved by God and God will deliver them. Do you see right next to each other, the Bible describes us as we, we should be those who fear the Lord, reverence, respect, worship, but we are also his beloved ones. You are loved by God. In fact, it's because he loves you that he disciplines you. It's because he loves you that he tries to wake you up with an earthquake sometimes. But while he is the one that can disrupt our lives to get our attention, he is also the one who calls us to him in restoration. And it is only God who can deliver us in this world and ultimately bring us salvation through Jesus Christ. It's not enough to merely repent or regret our sins. We must turn to God as the only one who can save us. And here David throws himself on the mercy and grace of God and says at the end of verse 5, Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. And this is going to come back later in the psalm and this idea that it is only by God's power That we are saved. We cannot rely on ourselves. We are saved only when we cry out to God in humble faith. And that is when He brings us to Himself in restoration as our refuge. In calling us to draw near to God in humble faith and repentance. David then takes a turn in verses 6 to 8 where he demonstrates that God is sovereign over every part of this world. Look at verses 6 to 8 with me. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Sukkot. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my wash basin, upon Edom I cast my shoe, over Philistia I shout in triumph. At this point in the psalm, David records God's own words. And he describes God as speaking in his holiness. And I think that underscores that God is not lying and what he is about to say is true and trustworthy. And so it begins in verses 6 to 7 of God dividing up and portioning out land. And all the places in verses 6 to 7 are places in Israel. So Gilead, Manasseh, Ephraim, Judah, Shechem, and the Vale of Sukkoth. It is a way for God to say, I am sovereign over my people by talking about the land in which his people inhabit. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter. Through faith, we belong to God, and he is sovereign over all that happens to us. But God is not merely sovereign over his people. In fact, he's sovereign over all the nations. Look at verse 8. Moab is my washbasin. 
Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. No one defeats God. God triumphs over all his enemies. And I love these pictures because they demonstrate the smallness of God's enemies. Moab is my wash basin, and upon Edom I cast my shoe. Moab is a tub of dirty water, and I flop my shoe upon Edom. You know, we've seen this before, especially in the Psalms, these poetic images that the psalmists give us where God's enemies are described in pathetic terms. And this helps us to see that no one can compare to God. These mighty nations, God's like, eh, they're my wash basin. To the Israelites who would fear these countries, David is telling them that these nations are nothing. They are tubs for God to wash his feet. And I don't know about you, but I've never met anyone who's afraid of a foot wash tub. Listen, we do not have to fear. Because God triumphs over all his enemies. And compared to him, they are nothing. Even the greatest powers of this earth are like foot wash tubs to our Lord. This leads us to the last movement of the psalm in verses 9 to 12 where we see the psalm that is meant to show us our need for repentance and restoration, giving us hope in our restoration with the Lord. Beginning of verse 9, who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. It seems helpful for me, and I hope for you, to view the experiences of David and Israel as physical and historical pictures of spiritual realities. Throughout the Psalms, and again in these verses, we are meant to see the military experience of Israel as emblematic of their relationship with God. So in verse 9, David implicitly asks the question to God, who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? He's basically asking God, who's going to lead us? Are you going to lead us? He asks this question because God so far has rejected them. But in this context, that rejection takes the form of not leading them into battle against their enemies. So he says, you do not go forth, O God, with our armies. And again, understanding the history of Israel, if God does not go with them, they have no hope of victory. And God is not going with them because he is disciplining them. Restoration can only occur through humble repentance and faith in God. And this is pictured in a military context in verse 11. Oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. Again, using battlefield imagery to represent spiritual truth, David knows that his only hope is in God. David must admit that no human effort can save his people. Vain is the salvation of man. This is in direct contrast to what we saw earlier in verse 5, where he said, Give salvation by your right hand. Said in different ways, he he knows that only salvation can come through the Lord. It cannot come through people. Just as his only hope in battle is in the Lord, when he is experiencing the discipline of God, it is only when we admit our need for the Lord, knowing that he alone can save, that we are able to be restored in right relationship with God. 
Israel could not win a battle without the Lord. You cannot win your salvation without the Lord. It is only with God that we shall do violently because it is he who will tread down our foes. A couple thoughts as we close up this morning. Number one, has God put a hardship in your life to get your attention? Maybe today you are currently experiencing the discipline of God. Or maybe you've never submitted to God in faith. You see, oftentimes God puts hardship in our lives so that we will repent and come back to him for restoration. Has God shaken your world like an earthquake? Has God caused you to stagger like a drunk to get your attention? Throughout the history of Israel, God caused Israel to face military defeat to get their attention. How is God trying to get your attention today? How is God trying to show you your need for restoration today? You know, as we talk about this, you know, the end of summer, going into the fall, there's this natural transition time that I don't want you to miss. What better way to begin the next stage of the calendar than with some humble faith and repentance? That's a way to prepare for the school year. God may send some earthquakes in your life. He may cause you to stagger. He may bring a crisis into your life. But he's doing so to get your attention because he loves you. And he's calling you to be restored to him. Secondly, this psalm shows us that God is sovereign over his people and the world. Even as God disciplines his children, we can find assurance in the fact that through faith in Jesus, we belong to him. All those statements of, they are mine, that is God also speaking to us. But God is not only sovereign over his people, he is sovereign over all the nations. Again, we see this ridiculous description of the enemies of Israel. Moab is my wash basin. God said to Israel, compared to me, your enemies are a bowl of dirty foot water. As God is disciplining his people, we do not have to be afraid of anyone because they are like bowls of water to God. God is sovereign over his people and over all the world. And finally, number three, God is our only hope of salvation. Follow the logic here. If God was the only way for the Israelites to have military victory, it is only through God that we can have salvation victory. Vain is the salvation of men. There is no hope in any other person. There is no hope in your own abilities. Your only hope is the Lord. And when you come to him in humble repentance and faith, you will find restoration. He will not turn you away. God is the savior of his people. God is our hope. And when we humble ourselves before him, he restores our soul. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. That we would see in David's words the humble heart we need to have to respond to your discipline in our lives with repentance and faith and humility. And God, that we see your sovereignty over our lives and the lives of every nation of this world. That your enemies are merely a foot wash bowl to you. And God, that we would see that you 
are the only one who offers hope. That our salvation is through you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.